Right. Um, do come in and have a pew. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, good. That's even better. Peter's a doctor. <laughs> anyway, well, Peter, sit wherever you want, but there's a, there's a wee rake of doctors at the front here. <coughs> There's another wee rake, a single rake of Norwegian doctor here. Um, you'll all spot folks at the doctors confidently come to the front. That's the kind of people they are. Uh, right, well, I think we're about to start. And uh, Lily, is that all right? Okay. Um, Lily, are you going to do... Well, let me just say hello to everybody that's watching on the live stream. Uh, we've started now because we don't want to lose you, because this is going to be a fabulous meeting. Um, and Lily's got some housekeeping-y type things to say, so let's just do that first, Lily. Hello. It's really um, just to explain that the door at the back will be closed in about 10 minutes, and you can't go out it once it's shut. <laughs> um, but there are two fire exits. It, it has to be shut by the staff. They've got an event happening in the next um, room. We won't be able to open it. So if you have to leave, if there's a fire alarm treat it as real. There is no drill anticipated. Um, the exits are this door and this door. Any latecomers will be brought in through that door at the back, so just be aware there might be folk. Um, I understand there's been quite a bad accident on the bypass. One of our um, Scottish responders um, is stuck in that uh, accident, so um, just be aware that people might be arriving because we've had quite a lot of bookings for this and they're not reflected in the faces I see shining back at me in the audience back over to Righty, thanks very much. Um, in case there's new faces here, uh, my name's Leslie Riddick. I'm a journalist. I'm also director of Nordic Horizons, which is a little policy group that's been rumbling away for, is it eight years? Uh, yes. <laughs> I know, it feels like it's a baby, but actually it's almost, it's been at school now for four years. Um, and our object has been to try to bring uh, specialists over from the Nordic nations because, ugh, lots of reasons, but mostly because they tend to be tediously good at things. And we might, as a country that has roughly the same population, might be interested in that. Um, especially as the Scottish government gets more and more powers, uh, we might want to think about the way that we're approaching policy decisions. So anyway, um, I should say that uh, all these events are paid for by the Scottish Government who finance bringing our speakers over, accommodation and such like, but actually the speakers themselves supply, supply their time free, which is an astonishing statement of something about folk from the Nordic countries. I think this is what you call international dugnad. Um, this dugnad being a kind of um, community work, if you like, or contribution to life. Uh, this this t event today, which is really looking at how the Norwegian Health Service works, and particularly at how northern rural places work, started off when I went uh, to Tromsø earlier this year to a conference. I have to say, got a little bit bored really by the conference, and then got fascinated by the idea that I was in a town that had probably one of the world's northernmost hospitals, whose reach goes right up to the exotic uh, Arctic north of Novaya Zemlya, which is a bit of a mind blower, um, and also by an article that demonstrated that all in the Norwegian Health Service was not quite as you would expect from the world's most equal society, because there are contributions by patients, and there is, a diff there is a, it's not possible to walk into A&E departments. So I went up and uh, to the hospital, and as is the way, managed to speak to the man running it, Tor Britson, who made time for a random journalist walking in off the street, right, with just a bit of curiosity. And the story was so interesting. I wrote a column. People here were a bit interested in how that different system worked. So Tor has come all the way from Tromso via, he's been all over Europe and the world, I think, lately for the last couple of weeks, uh, to give a talk here about how that health system works. And we have also uh, some tremendous speakers who I'll introduce afterwards uh, from the Scottish side of things who can respond and see if there's anything in this system that could help us particularly managing demand as we sit at the beginning of another winter season where operations already been cancelled and we're not quite sure how we'll get through this season again. So uh, would you give a warm Edinburgh Hugely warm Edinburgh welcome, please, uh, for Tor Ingebrigtsen.
Thank you very much, Leslie, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I think it's great to be here. Um, I just visited Scotland as a tourist this summer, and I have visited the NHS Highlands a few times, and feel that I have learned a lot from you. Um, so, um, so, so that that's just very good. Um, you don't see it that good, but as Leslie said, we're all the way up here. This is the world seen from the top. Tromsø is about 400 kilometers by road north of the Arctic Circle. It's dark now, no sun. Uh, it will be back on the 21st of January, so it's good to come here and get a glimpse of it now. Um, I... What happens now? There we are. So, I thought that I had to start out with saying that I have a few things to, uh, to, to, to disclaim. I, I am a native to North Norway, which means that I'm inherently skeptic to any idea from Oslo, <laughs> which might influence my presentation a bit. Um, I am on the left side of politics, um, and I am a neurosurgeon and not an economist, so you have to apologize if my terms speaking about health economy in English aren't completely correct. Um, and I have, been a, um, uh, I have been a CEO for uh, 10 years for the university hospital, uh, and someone would say that that's a bias in itself. Some people in healthcare are very skeptic to the CEOs. Um, my career ended abruptly in February, and I thought I wanted to tell you that just because it illustrates that we have our controversies in Norwegian healthcare as well. This is myself and the lead of the board who uh, resigned together with me, and even the deputy lead resigned, uh, because we had a disagreement with the regional authorities about the organization of percutaneous coronary intervention for heart infarction in our region. At the moment, it is centralized to Tromsø. They want to decentralize it to yet another hospital. We think that's a very bad idea for a small population. We think it doesn't match the volume quality uh, connection. Um, so this became so difficult that someone had to leave and uh, it turned out to be me. Uh, which I'm actually quite happy with after having done this work for 10 years. So it, among other things, it enabled me to, to come here today. Um, being in Scotland, I feel that I, I also have to touch upon the history. Um, the development that Norway and Norwegian healthcare has gone through in just a little bit more than one generation is just fantastic. Uh, these are pictures of, guess what? It's the British Marine bombing uh, my dad's childhood home. Uh, in the end of May in 1940, uh, you know, the Germans, they, they took our country and uh, the British came in with French and Polish forces to uh, try to throw them out again. Um, so my family became very much affected by this. Uh, despite that, he was learning us kids songs about the Englishmen coming to rescue. So the relation to everything British has always been very good. The picture to the right is uh, a young Scottish officer. I think he was here from Edinburgh. He actually saved much of the local population in the city of Norvik because he understood that they had to be evacuated before the German counterattack. So he, he is a hero uh, acting against the orders of his superiors and rescuing probably thousands of North Norwegians uh, in 1940. Um, so before I come to my main topic, um, even, even this, we uh, toured Scotland this summer with friends. 
visited Lock Eve, where my friend's uh, dad uh, were many times during the convoys during the war, uh, remembering that. And we even visited uh, Magnus Cathedral, which once upon a time uh, was Norwegian. It's in Kirkwall on the, on the Orkneys, as you probably know. Um, so that's my introduction, and now to Norwegian healthcare. We are a population of 5.3 million people, very similar to Scotland. Our gross domestic product of 57,000 pounds per capita is a bit more than yours, uh, which of course is uh, due to more or less only the oil. So we've been very happy, lucky with that. Um, the healthcare system is based on a universal tax-based coverage. We all pay about 8.2% 8 of our income in health insurance. Or we, don't, we never see that we're paying it, but that's the amount that, uh, that is taken away from our wages for this purpose. It's a single-payer system. Uh, but to my concern, private health insurance is becoming more common because some of the big private employers believe that they can reduce sick leave by insuring all their employees. So that's a paradoxically growing business, and I'll come a little bit back to that. This is a figure from the OECD showing the... Um, uh, the average uh, proportion of the, uh, or the per capita gross domestic product uh, here, and the proportion um, that goes to healthcare uh, as these spots. And you'll see that Norway is at the upper end of the scale, um, but the amount that we spend per capita is below both Luxembourg and Switzerland, for example, a little bit more than Germany. Uh, and the proportion of the state budget is well below what is spent, for example, in French. So it's a relatively main, uh, relatively contained or restricted system with regard to the proportion of money spent on health. But the spendings are at a relatively high level uh, in European comparisons. Um, <clears throat> I have to say a few words about the way we are organized, because that's quite different from, from the Scottish and British uh, uh, way to do it. There are two very specific and uh, independent organizational levels. So primary care is uh, taken care of by the, uh, by the local councils. And there are 422 altogether. Some of them are very small, down to about 1,000 inhabitants. Uh, the average council has about four, five, six thousand 6,000 inhabitants. And some, like the cities, have uh, tens of thousands. So there's a very big variation in the size of the organizations being responsible for primary care. Um, all councils run a general practitioner service, and the general practitioners are typically private contractors contracted by the municipality. This system is in an acute crisis now, which has come quite surprisingly, and it seems to be caused by a generation shift. Young female doctors coming in now they do not want the business part of medicine. So they want to be employed, uh, and there seems to be a shift going on towards the councils employing the GPs, which is challenging because then the administrators and politicians become responsible for um, replacing the employees during holidays and uh, maternity leave and stuff like that. So that's a new challenge. Every council has to have a GP on call 24-7, um, 365 days a year. And this is typically organized in collaboration in the smaller counties between uh, two or more of them. So if there are 10 GPs in, let's say, three neighboring councils, then they'll typically uh, rotate being on call every 10 days for the three 
the, the three uh, municipalities taken together. Um, the other significant difference is that as a main rule, you have to see the GP on call before going to A&E at hospitals. You cannot just walk into A&E as you do uh, here in Britain. Um, and um, I think that works very well. It, it, it uh, ensures a um, sustainable triage at a lower level than the hospitals, which I consider good. Um, and then finally, the councils are responsible for all nursing services, both in the patient's homes and in nursing homes. So that's um, one part of the system. The second main part of the healthcare system is specialized care, including the hospitals. And we are organized under four regional health authorities who operate 20 health enterprises. Um, and the health enterprises typically run a group or three to five uh, hospitals coordinated as one system. Altogether, there are 55 acute care hospitals in the country. The hospitals also run the ambulance services. Um, and, they, uh, uh, and the uh, emergency or the ambulance dispatch centers are localized and run by the hospitals, uh, which means that you can get in direct contact with the hospital if you want to by dialing uh, 113, which equals your triple nine, but they will typically direct you to the GP on call unless it is something obviously very emergent like cardiac infarction. Um, the health regions also contract a number of private operators, uh, which is politically intended to ensure some stress on the public sector to compete on effectiveness with private uh, providers. Um, more specifically about our region, we are uh, nearly half a million people. The distance from southwest to the Russian border in the northeast is uh, about 2,000 kilometers by road. One university hospital in Tromsø, which is uh, here. Ten general district hospitals, and the most remotely one located on the Spitsbergen Islands. A number of psychiatric institutions included in this system. And the pre-hospital system is really comprehensive. Uh, on any average day, we have ten aircraft uh, in the air transporting uh, planned transports, inter-hospital transports, and uh, transports from primary care to hospitals and emergency transports to and from hospitals. So this is one of the reasons for the relatively high cost level is the, uh, the high costs of running the, uh, the air ambulance system. The university hospital, which I have been heading for a bit more than 10 years, is affiliated with the Arctic University of Norway, which also has its main campus in Tromsø. Uh, we are a five hospital system. I'm not going to go through the numbers in detail, uh, but we run most secondary and tertiary hospital services except from uh, transplantations. 6,000 employees and a budget of about uh, 650 million pounds a year. Uh, and then you'll see directly that this is more money per employee than uh, an average Scottish hospital would have. That's just a picture of the campus. Uh, now in the, the uh, dark time of the year, we get a little bit of daylight in the middle of the day, but not more than what you see here. Um, then before I get to um, the economy and the patient co-payment, I have to say a little about, bit about two quite recent reforms in Norwegian healthcare. Um, in 2002, we had a hospital ownership reform. Ownership was transferred from the 19 counties, which is the mid-political level between local councils and the state. So ownership was transferred to the state. 
and the state organized uh, specialized care in these four regions that I have already mentioned. The main aim for this was to contain the chronic deficits and overspending in the hospital sector and to improve quality. Uh, we had an obvious insufficient or unsatisfactory quality caused by a lack of coordination between the many small county operated hospitals. Um, and some of the measured um, used to achieve quality improvement was clarifying expectations to leaders, especially for leaders in these new groups of hospitals uh, in the health enterprises. Um, and at the same time, time, a wide range of measurements, key performance indicators were introduced and the health regions were given professional boards, as, which was very diff different from the previous county-led uh, boards, uh, which were manned only by politicians. So this was a big change. Then next, 10 years later, in 2012, we had another reform, the integrated care reform, which came on because by that time, um, our leaders at the national level felt that the hospital reform had been a success, but the coordination between these 422 counties and the hospitals between primary care and specialized care wasn't good enough. So the aim of this reform was to improve the coordination, and the main tool for achieving that was formal contracts regulating a lot of details in the collaboration between primary and secondary care. A lot of work with large amounts of documents. And then, interestingly, the councils also got new and very much more responsibility for running 24-7 uh, beds and for taking admissions uh, of inpatients. Um, so any patient in, in need of a bed overnight, but not really needing a hospital bed, was decided to be managed by the councils. Examples could be an elderly patient with a slowly declining level of function, for example, because of dementia. So when you get to the point where it just doesn't work at home anymore, maybe because of a pneumonia that could be treated uh, just with, with uh, oral medication. Before this reform, such a patient would typically be admitted as an emergency to hospital. After this reform, the council got responsible for taking such patients acutely. And at the end, other end, they got the same kind of responsibility for patients ready for discharge from hospital and a economic penalty for delaying these charges was introduced. I'll come back to that more in detail. So, how did this go? Well, there has been a number of formal evaluations. This one is from the Research Council Norway. And generally, the um, the formal evaluations say that these reforms, and especially the hospital reform, has been a great success. The economic results have improved. Most hospital health enterprises have been operated with surpluses for the last 10 years, including the, uh, the University Hospital of North Norway. Um, efficiency has been measured and it has improved with at least 40% over the last 10 years. All enterprises have had surpluses, allowing, allocating more money to investments. Uh, so we have been building more um, new hospitals and investing more in successful IT projects uh, than we did in the decades before the reform. Um, it is also very clear that quality has improved. This has been measured thoroughly, and uh, 
Process quality like waiting times, time to biopsy or surgery for cancer patients, number of such things has improved a lot. Um, and there is also clear evidence that outcomes has improved, for example, because uh, better coordination allowed centralization of cancer surgery. Um, and not at least measures of patient satisfaction and involvement of patients' organizations at the hospital boards has clearly resulted in, uh, in improved patient satisfaction. So from everything that can be measured, this has been a success. Uh, but as always, there is a backside of the medal because the employees and the workers' unions, they are not satisfied. Uh, they generally feel that work pressure has increased and reached an intolerable level. Uh, many feel that autonomy has been reduced, especially the doctors, which is true because they have to report the quality and, uh, uh, and a, a much stronger coordinating leadership has been introduced. So they are not allowed to do um, as they wanted to in the same way as before the reform. We have a policy group uh, which thinks that new public management is the worst thing that can happen to the public sector in Norway. So this word has kind of become a very negatively stamped expression which is used to, to describe what has happened. Um, the citation at the bottom here is typical for what they write in the newspaper. It's a virus invented by Margaret Thatcher and spread to Norway by Tony Blair. <laughs> so that, that, that's how uh, the present state is perceived by many healthcare employees, by some organizations, and to some degree also by the left-wing political parties. Um, so that's, that's the, con uh, the context uh, for our present uh, financial systems. So then I'll move on to talk about patient co-payment, which, uh, and I have to say a lot about the way we are financed in general to set that in, context, in a context too. So first, just, I just came to remember this story. This is obviously me, uh, a long time ago, uh, around 1990, and it's my old Saab, which I used to drive around as a GP on call back then. And I was doing my, my military service as, a, as an army physician and, and took calls over the weekends to, to earn more money. And, <laughs> I had a very good night, a uh, lot of children with, uh, with a cold and tonsillitis, and I was driving from house to house collecting co-payment from patients. And then when I came to about the 10th visit, then the mom said, oh, no, 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 no. The co-payment was stopped by the government last week. I'm not paying. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I had to redo the whole round the next week, the, 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 the next night, hand back all the cash to the, to the families. <laughs> but the good thing about it is that I still have the sub. It's running. <laughs> um, the co-payment system has been there as long as I can remember, which means at least since the, the end of the 1970s. I don't know its historical background, to be honest, but it's a common system uh, for both primary and specialized health care. There are a few exemptions. Children under the age of 16 are exempted, and people who have sustained occupational injuries are exempted. Um, otherwise, everybody has to pay. Um, then there is a cap on it. So if you pay more than uh, 205 pounds, uh, then it's free for the rest of the year, and you get automatically you get an electronic exemption card. And there is a uh, website for all health services in Norway, which is very easy to, uh, 
to use. So I, I just logged in yesterday, clicked patient co-payment, and for my own report for this year, I have paid 696 kroners. So I've got another 1,562 to go before it's free. And I probably won't make that before New Year, so I won't get an exemption card this year. Um, in primary care, the co-payment makes up a significant proportion of the uh, budget for GP practices. This is the proportion, it's about 20%, the rest is tax-based. So the patients pay to the GPs make up um, a significant proportion. For the nursing home, uh, nursing services, it's a lot less, altogether about 7%. Then there is co-payment for physiotherapy and other services too. I won't go into those details uh, because GP practices and uh, nursing services are the most significant ones in, in volume. Um, these are the amounts. Regular consultation at the GP, 19 pounds. Night time, 28 pounds. Home visit, 23. Home visit at night. 34 pounds. So you see that if you, um, if you have a GP visiting at home around three times, then the fourth visit will be for free. That, that's, the, uh, that's the amounts. When it comes to nursing care, all nursing at home is free. You can have a council nurse coming to your house six times a day to take care of you and people get that kind of services when they are to avoid nursing home admittance and it's free. Um, Short-term stay in nursing home, 15 pounds a day. For long-term stay, uh, the council takes most of your income but nothing of your savings. And if you doesn't have an income, uh, everybody has, but if you're on the lowest possible pension, then they could take around 75% of your income. If you have a high pension, as for example I will have when I retire, then they take 85%. So that's a very significant co-payment. Um, then the hospitals run by the regional health authorities. They are supposed to provide equality both in access and quality of the services. Uh, as I said, they run the businesses mainly through the public health enterprises, public hospitals, 88%, uh, and about 12% is um, by contracted private providers, completely paid by the public insurance system. Um, I talked a little bit about the investments. They are done by equity, which the enterprises get from their annual surpluses. Um, a mix of 30% equity and 70% loan. And the bank is the Ministry of Health. So this building a new hospital is just like building a new house. Uh, you save till you have 30%, then you go to the ministry and ask for, uh, for a loan. Um, and to, to do this, the um, investments have to be uh, sustainable, of course. Push the wrong button again. Uh, here we go. Um, the annual budgets, they have evolved during the last decades. In the 60s and the 70s, it used to be a simple refund for the number of days, uh, a refund per patient per bed per day created uncontrolled growth and long hospital stays and queues and waiting lists didn't work. Then they changed to fixed budgets in the 90, 1980s and 90s, didn't work either, caused uncontrolled deficits, um, long queues and waiting lists and no money for investments. Uh, so this was changed again uh, around the time of the reform in 2002. So now we get 50% as a block grant and 50% of activity based, as activity based funding. Um, and 
the patient co-payment makes up only 2% of this in, uh, in the hospitals, so it's a lot less than in primary care. So I'll take you through how this works now. First the uh, block grant, and then the uh, activity-based funding, and then the co-payment. So the block grant is uh, distributed first from the state to the four regional authorities, and then from the regional authority to the hospital enterprises in a two-step process with the same principles, same mathematical model um, applied in both steps. Uh, it's a quite complicated model um, built up by a needs component and a cost component and a mobility component. Uh, and the needs component makes up much of, most of it, 88%. It's based on um, demographics, like the uh, number of old people, number of immigrants, a few more characters, socioeconomic factors, like um, the number of uh, people on disabled pensions, a few other factors. And a funny one, which is about latitude, so you get more money the further north in the country you come, that's uh, mainly a proxy for uh, compensating the air ambulance service. Um, then there is a cost component, which is the, the extra costs caused by political decisions, which isn't directly related to patient treatment. So for example, the university hospitals get paid extra for education and research. Um, travel distances by road is compensated in a mathematical, distance, uh, mathematical ma model. And um, the number of hospitals with A&E room rooms per 100,000 population is also a factor in the model, because in some regions it would obviously be uh, economic, economically um, best to reduce the number of hospitals, but the politicians doesn't want to do that, so to compensate um, enterprises with many acute care hospitals, they build this into the model. And then there is the mobility component, which uh, simply makes the money follow the patient if the patient wants to, to, to go for treatment uh, uh, elsewhere. Then comes the, uh, the activity-based system, which is complex too. Um, in this system, every single patient is allocated to a DRG group, depending on a coding of the diagnosis and the procedures that the patient has gone through at the hospital. So, so um, every DRG group is priced. For example, if someone has a brain tumor and is operated for that, then you get into a DRG group with high pay. Um, and then the hospital get half of those money, the other half um, comes from the, um, from, from, from the, the fixed part of the budget. This is in a way balanced. The DRG system is meant to be neutral, which means that if you do too much, then you get punished by having operating costs which the system doesn't cover completely. And other, on, on the other hand, if you do too little, uh, then you lose income um, and, um, and, and get deficits because of that. So they try to balance it to to kind of give an incentive to, to, to the best possible level of activity. Um, then finally, in the hospitals, um, the co-payments make up 2% of the income, which charge outpatients and some day surgery procedures, while all admissions are free. And these are the costs. Consultation with a specialist, 32 pounds. Imaging, like an MRI, 23 pounds. 
uh, and articles consumed like uh, wound dressings or whatever drug you might get at the outpatient clinic, um, seven pounds. So this could add up to about 60 pounds for a consultation where you have imaging and maybe some uh, interventions and, and, and see a specialist. Interestingly, there is a penalty of about the same am uh, amount for non-attendance. Uh, and that's because non-attendance is actually a problem. About 10% of patients doesn't show up, uh, which of course causes insufficiency and waiting lists. And finally, we have to pay for three specific procedures, sterilization of men, sterilization of women, which is expensive, uh, and circumcision of boys, which has been very controversial. The Muslims and the Jews want it uh, um, and, uh, and uh, can get it in the hospitals if they pay for it. Um, and then finally, before I come to some opinions about this, the penalty for delayed discharge, which the councils have to pay, is 431 pounds a day. And this is enforced from day one after uh, the patient being defined as ready for discharge by the hospital. So we have the power at the hospitals to do that definition. Uh, the criteria that we have to fulfill is that uh, the issue causing the admission has to be clarified, Th there has to be a diagnosis and a treatment plan which the council can, uh, can take over, uh, and any change in the patient's functional level has to be described so the council healthcare system can relate to it. And then they have to start to pay if they do not uh, take the patient by 24 hours after a message has been sent. Um, just one more thing before my discussion. This is kind of the final measure that we have taken to control demand. Uh, to control demand. Um, we make population-based health atlases displaying uh, variations in hospital use. This is just an example of hemorrhoids, and you do not see it so clearly, but dark color is, uh, uh, is high use, and light colors is low use. And this shows that the number of patients getting operated for hemorrhoids uh, varies by a factor of four per population uh, at the moment. And so the idea of this is that just informing, showing uh, physicians that it is like this is going to be an incentive to reduce overuse, maybe to increase underuse if that is a problem. And the other thing is that the uh, Department of Finances take this into consideration when they adjust the DRG system year by year. So, for example, if they think that, uh, that, that overuse is a bigger problem than, than underuse for hemorrhoid operations, then they take down the value of those operations in the DRG system a little bit. Another example, when, when we learned that primary reconstruction after breast cancer is better than two-step procedures, taking the tumor first and doing the reconstruction later, then they took down the payment for the two-step procedures, increased the payment for primary reconstruction, uh, which <coughs> almost overnight improved the... Uh, the uh, uh, the treatment for patients. So the combination of the DRG system and this knowledge about the level of use uh, is built into the financing system. So then to the final part, uh, how are discussions about this? 
Uh, well, there are obviously pros and cons with activity-based funding. Um, the pros is that it is a flexible system which, uh, which offers incentives for regulating use. Adjustments can both restrict overuse and stimulate new necessary treatments to, uh, to, to come into use. Uh, I also feel that, or I, I am sure that all this coding improves public health statistics and makes, for example, those atlases showing the use quite reliable. So th these are the pros. Uh, the most important cons is, of course, that this is very bureaucratic. Uh, it obviously shifts resources from patient treatment to all this coding and to uh, administrative work, which is a challenge. Uh, it is a zero-sum system. It doesn't make more money, it just shifts money between hospitals. So the hospitals have responded with increasing the number of, number of DRG consulates, the number of coders, and so on. So it, it has increased the proportion of bureaucrats in the hospital organizations. Um, the most severe criticism is that it mimics the commercial business sector, injects a kind of cynicism in, in, in the system, and. Uh, kind of undermines the solidaric core values of healthcare. This is typically an argument brought forward by some of the unions and, and by some policy associations. Um, then there is a temptation for fraud, and we have had very severe fraud cases where hospital departments have tried to trick the, trick the system with obviously incorrect coding. Um, finally, it's my personal view that it is a pro that is, it's, it, it is politically flexible too. What typically happens when we have a shift between a labor and a conservative government and the other way around is that they, they do not overthrow the entire system. They just adjust the mix between fixed, fixed budget and DRG funding. So. The Labour Party tend to set it to 60-40, uh, and then when a Conservative government come in, they put it back to 50-50. So, changes a little bit, uh, no big earthquakes, uh, which I, at least, uh, as a leader, thought was an advantage. We, we, had, uh, uh, we could trust that the system was reasonably stable over time. The co-payment is, is controversial. Not its existence, but, but the level of payment. So this is the current conservative health minister to the right and his uh, Labour Party opponent to the left uh, in a debate about how much the co-payment for medicines uh, should increase. And typically, the Labour Party wanted to increase a little bit less than the consumer index. Uh, and, uh, and the conservatives wanted to increase a little bit more to restrict demand. That's a typical uh, discussion. I looked up some scientific evidence of this and found a very interesting Norwegian report written in 2014 by our most uh, prominent health economist, Tadja Hagen, unfortunately not available in English. But his analysis is that there is an inherent conflict in this between the mutual insurance uh, based on our taxes, which everybody wants to have, and on the same time we want a, uh, a prioritization of, uh, the, of cost-effective services. So he, he thinks that this has to be balanced in one or another way. Um, I think the evidence is clear that when you increase the co-payment, then, uh, then there is a decrease in demand, and there is also very clear evidence in the literature that you can cause underuse of necessary services uh, if you increase the co-payment too much. Uh, and the other way around, there is clear evidence that you can restrict excess use by increasing co-payment. So, 
I feel that in our system we have kind of tried to balance this out. Um, there is a general fixed rate payment to consultation, a flat fee, which everybody has to pay. Um, we do not have income-based um, scaling of it, but we have this annual cap which is meant to protect poor people. Uh, and we have this small um, uh, priority-based co-payment charging for sterilization and circumcisions. And the graph here is it's just, a, and it's just an example of how powerful this can be. Um, the red dot is steri the red line is sterilization of men, and this no, no, of women, and this co-payment was introduced in uh, 2002, and you see that the sterilization rate for women dropped abruptly uh, the same year. Um, for men, it didn't change, so I guess it can be discussed whether this uh, is a good or a bad thing. Our um, our birth rate is too low, so maybe it's a good thing, I don't know. Women probably disagree, <laughs> uh, but that's how it worked. So, to come to a kind of conclusion, um, I think that the co-payment has to be seen as a part of a very complex financial system, which is a mix of most available measures block grants, activity-based, uh, different incentive and penalty mechanisms, uh, and some competition from private providers. Uh, I think it's a pragmatic system, um, which seems to be quite stable now, but at the same time flexible when politically necessary. Um, I'm not really concerned about charging patients in this system. Um, what I am concerned about is that many big private companies increasingly insure their patients. Uh, so we do have now a development where private hospitals are established, especially in the Oslo region, but also in a small city like Tromsø. Uh, and they they even try to get into cancer care now. I'm quite convinced that they, for example, are causing overtreatment of prostate cancer uh, in the private sector because of that. And where do they get their staff? Of course, from the public sector, which has a lack of urologists and nurses. So that, that's what really, um, um, what really worries me. I think that we should have a political regulation uh, uh, restricting the possibilities for private insurances. So, finally, uh, what happened? I just wanted to show you a nice, a nice picture, but that's maybe too late. I can't find back, or maybe I can. No, it's too dark. Let's not waste time on that. <laughs> it's okay. So thank you. Right, well, thanks very much to Tor. Um, he's still determined to show that picture. No, no, I'll give it. Don't, don't, hey, go. <laughs> you know, you're halfway there. Just keep going. <laughs> um, right, while he's. Yeah, get this to work a bit better. Um, we've got, as I said, we've got quite a few, and thanks for arriving, this Adam. Yeah. yeah, is it awful? Yeah, yeah, there's been some sort of accident on the, um, on the bike box. So yes. Oh, well, I appreciate it, you soldiering on. Um, but the idea, if you haven't been to any of our meetings before, what we began to realize was we invite speakers to come from another country and describe how their system works. And quite a lot of the time, we don't really know how our own system works enough to actually map it in our minds as to what the difference is. Um, and also, there's obviously some ideas in here that are kind of a bit controversial, at least within the Scottish context, about paying for anything in health service. So um, it'd be very interesting to, make, to hear what other medics make of that. So we have um, 
well, a small queen of, a, of uh, speakers. Whoops, not going to go that live microphone. Um, and, you know, they could just come up and say a few thoughts about whatever they want, really. But um, we've got Adam Collins, Dr. Adam Collins, uh, who's an NHS junior doctor training in emergency medicine. Um, well, I've got everything about you here. Graduated from Edinburgh University in 2014. So he's, he's the youngest guy in the room, isn't he? Anybody want to take him on? No, right, okay. <laughs> um, he split his time between clinical work with the NHS and policy and political work with the British Medical Association. And last year he chaired uh, BMA Scotland's Junior Doctors Committee and this year has a role in the ongoing English contract negotiations. Right, that almost sounds like it's astonishing that you have enough brain space to breathe. But anyway, um, and also you didn't hear the whole of that, but you got in for the time, you know, for the payments aspects of things. So I don't know if this is working. Do you want to say, come up and say anything, Adam, about what you heard? Let's see, I'm usually, usually fairly loud anyway. Oh, it does work, good. Um, hello, uh, thank you very much for having me. As I've, I've kind of had the introduction, um, and that is really everything there is to know about me, so now you know it all, there's nothing else for me to say. Um, I work in emergency medicine, so I suppose that I see the, the frontline presentations of medicine um, from the youngest to the oldest, um, from utter nonsense to the, the absolute most serious medicine that comes into the hospital, um, and we, we deal with all of it. I think the model of funding that's been described is very interesting. Um, I think the, the kind of state side of the funding, um, splitting between a kind of block grant, which is more similar to the system that we have in Scotland, um, but also activity-based payment, which is the system we have in England, is a really nice balance. Um, it's clear to me that the systems in Scotland and England both have their advantages and disadvantages, and actually a blend of the two with the allowance for some tweaking at the kind of government level to, to push things in a certain direction is quite an interesting one. I think it's interesting, particularly that the um, DRG payments are, are, are tweaked not only based on cost, but on that desire to incentivize what we now see as the more effective treatment. I think in the UK, or certainly in England, it's a very cost-based model. And then sometimes we decline to fund certain things. So you may have heard recently that there has been a move to not fund certain operations or certain interventions south of the border. Um, uh, because we now believe them not to be effective. And, and the way that the government is trying to influence that is to just kind of say the NHS isn't going to fund them. Um, having that blend where you, you simply reduce the funding a little bit to kind of discourage people from offering it um, is quite an interesting way of doing that. I wonder, though, whether it's on the, on the flip side of that, I wonder whether it's slightly more subtle and it doesn't allow people to as easily understand what the government is restricting their access to um, and that that may therefore, uh, you know, have a, have a slightly less open approach to the entire situation. Um, in terms of co-payments, which I suppose is probably the big ticket controversy of the evening, I'm getting the impression anyway. Um, in terms of co-payments, again, I think the cap is an interesting feature. Um, so that's nice from an economics point of view. If you stand back and you think about people's annual salary and their annual pay, they might well be able to afford some co-payments and then you could stop them at some point. Um, I can imagine there would be all sorts of exceptions for people potentially who were on benefits, et cetera, et cetera. What it probably doesn't account for, though, is people having to face a single one-off cost at one point, which may not be affordable for them. Um, and that, I think, is where you would have the issue. Actually, the sort of people, I think, who, who abuse the health service or who use it for things they don't need to or don't put the kind of time and effort into thinking where they might want to go um, and, for example, go to a community pharmacy or wait to see their GP and maybe come to ourselves instead, I think they possibly are, are the sort of people who would be less cognizant of the cost and would think it was possibly worth it and would be willing to spend that money. Um, and actually, the people that we'd put off um, are often the, the sort of more vulnerable people in society who even with a relatively small cost, because the numbers, on the, you know, the numbers in front of us are, are relatively speaking small for single consultations, but putting people off spending that money at all can lead to people presenting later um, and then for being more unwell, um, potentially A, them being more unwell, which in itself is a bad thing, but from a wider point of view, the more unwell they are when they turn up, the longer it takes us to fix them and the more resources we have to put into fixing them. So I, I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to see sort of more analysis on whether it does increase delayed presentation, whether it does push people into one mode of service or into, you know, into another. Um, but it was very interesting to hear from you, even though I only caught the tail end. So thank you very much. Where do you want to go? Uh, thank you very much. Well, as well, if you, yeah, we might sit here. That's yeah, fine. Um, now we have Peter Curry, who's actually oh. been to Tromso and has just come back. Right, but in no coordinated way, just sort of the luck of the Irish. Um, he's a consultant anaesthetist working in NHS 5, at least he were, 
um, also was clinical lead uh, for e-health in the area. Uh, he worked from pediatrics, moved to anesthetics and intensive care, worked for 23 years in Fife. Um, he's now semi-retired, uh, but is a medical examiner, examiner for Healthcare Improvement Scotland and is on the, uh, as a member of the, the councils of the BMA in Scotland and Britain. So, Peter, you do, well, could you... I did. <laughs> could you use the microphone just because it helps people on the uh, live stream? Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you, Tor, for talking to us in such an interesting way. I think I need to make it clear to all of you, Tromso is a very, very long way away. If you go to Tromso, it's a little, uh, just under 1,800 kilometres to Oslo, I believe, which is one and a half times the distance between Lerwick and Westminster. So they are very isolated up there in the north. The quickest way by road is actually through Sweden and not through Norway, um, so you have to go through another country if you want to drive. Uh, it is, however, a beautiful city. Um, I believe today is the last day that the sun came above the horizon in Tromsø, and it's now, I think you call it evening or night until the end of January or nearly the end of January. Do go and visit. It is beautiful. The cathedral, the midnight concerts are, on, are wonderful. Um, it's an interesting city because when you drive around, you find you're driving underground. They have traffic lights and roundabouts and car parks underground, and then you pop up in the city um, wherever you want to go. Uh, an unusual city, a beautiful city, uh, and certainly one worth visiting. Thank you for your ideas on, on payment. I think there are a lot of similarities, as Adam has said, between the healthcare systems across the Nordic countries. And I have spent time, not in Norway, but I spent quite a lot of time in Sweden and Finland talking to them about their systems. They're not identical, but there's a lot of similarities between them. <clears throat> I've also spent time in the UK working with the National Audit Office, not on co-payment, but we spent time looking at the charging of those people who avail themselves of NHS services that are free, uh, commonly called health tourism. And there is an interesting challenge that the cost that you would spend in catching health tourism, in charging health tourism, is actually significantly more than you would get back for the vast majority of hospitals in the UK. So it's not actually worth it. There are obviously some hospitals like St Mary's in London and, and one or two of the other target hospitals for health tourism where it, it, it would actually be worthwhile, but the majority of hospitals it isn't. The thing that worries me about co-payment are two things. One is actually the administration of charging all of this, working out what people are due, the, the getting it off them, getting them to pay it. Um, Norwegians are much more law-abiding than we are. Um, when they're asked to pay something, they'll pay it. Um, uh, our, um, our population here is perhaps not as cooperative or as obliging as, as our Norwegian friends. So there would be an element of chasing people, there would be an element of spending money to get the money back. And one wonders, at the end of the day, is that really worth it? The other problem is that we have this principle in the NHS, it is free at the point of care. And the, the time that you need health care is when you're, you are at your most stressed. It may not be a huge sum of money, but it, is, it can be a significant sum of money to some people and some of the people who are in the most needy. And often the, the elderly will be avoiding going if, if they have to pay when perhaps they shouldn't be. So I think that there is that concern. The other concern about it is that there is obviously a political will amongst some of our political masters to move towards an increase in private uh, health care and move towards private insurance and all, the all that goes with that. And I think, Tor, you've quite rightly alluded to the risks that that produces, the, the imbalance that produces when it starts to try and coexist with um, NHS carefree at the point of, of delivery. In Scotland, we have a lot less private health insurance and a lot less private care than other parts of the UK. 
There's significant amounts, obviously, in the southeast of England. There's pockets around Manchester. Uh, the, most, the majority of private care is actually delivered in, in, in Aberdeen in Scotland, um, and that's related to the fact that we have the oil industry there. And I think uh, you, you've got quite a big private hospital in Bergen uh, associated with the oil industry, but the oil industry is stretching up, Scotland, uh, up Norway now, um, and I know you've got quite a lot of uh, new influx of, of that business into places like Shirkiness, right in the far north, which is the far end of your, your patch apart from Svalbard. Um, so there are risks associated with that. It may be the thin end of the, thin end of the wedge, so to speak, and do we want that? The, the other thing is, as soon as you start to um, ask people to pay for something, they start to think they've got an entitlement to it. Well, I think a lot of our patients think they've got an entitlement to it anyway. But if they're actually paying for it, they can get actually um, slightly more demanding, perhaps. And that's something that um, I think you perhaps do see. Uh, not, I'm not particularly talking to, about Norway, but in countries where the general population have to stump up, um, they, they, they've become more demanding about what they're getting. Um, and we certainly don't have the capacity in the health service at the moment. We don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses to meet the demand that we're facing. And creating more administration, creating more people who are managing a process and not delivering it actually has to be very effective if it's going to be worth doing. So you actually have to ask yourself sometimes, is it worth doing this? And I think it would be interesting in knowing how much you actually spend on collecting the money that you, you collect through co-payment, because the numbers are quite small. The other thing that I think might jar slightly here is the fact that it, it's not means tested at all. We are very much in love in the UK with means testing what we do. And the, the chairman of Statoil probably has gone private anyway, but if he went uh, to the public sector in Norway, he would pay exactly the same as somebody who was unemployed and on state benefits. So in that sense, we probably wouldn't consider it fair. I think in Norway, it's something that you've been used to for a very long time, and you cope with it. We coped with prescription uh, payments for a very long time, but it hasn't actually got a whole lot worse since we scrapped them. The prediction was that when we scrapped prescription payments, lots more people would go and get lots more prescriptions. That actually hasn't happened. The number of prescriptions that people pick up is still very much the same as it was when they used to pay for them. So yes, there is a deterrent element, but it may not be as big as you think it's going to be. And thanks, for, thanks very much once again for talking to us. embarrassment of medical riches we have here, because Miles might have some other observations that you want to put in, and then can you possibly, can your brain contain all these questions, Tor? I'm noting them down. That's right, so we've both got notes, okay. So um, we also have Miles Mack, um, who was the chair of the Royal College of GPs in Scotland, um, so more, more observations. Um, do you want to just move that around a bit? Yeah. Right, okay. Well, Thank you very much. Yeah, um, so I'm coming from the general practice angle of things, and I've come from um, the north of Scotland, so I'm going back to north of Inverness tonight. Um, and I've had some more recent interest in some of the very rural communities we've got on the west coast um, and how we deliver care to these areas, which has been intriguing in its own right. So I've got a, a number of questions about how rurality is accounted for on this. It seems that, particularly in the, pri in the primary care side of things, um, we've got a big problem in here in that the workload allocation formula, which was negotiated for the new GP contract, seemed to completely fail to account for the, the costs of providing in rural areas. Um, so we've had a situation where almost all the rural practices in Scotland have, have been stuck at, a, at a, a, a cost and will be likely to be stuck there for some time, um, whereas areas in quite a lot of practice in Edinburgh and the Central Belt 
have had an uplift in costing to do that. We've also got a problem in Scotland in that actually there's been a complete failure to invest in general practice over a, a large number of years. Um, and we dropped from 9.8% of the NHS budget to primary care, to general practice, down to, I believe, less than 7% of the last figures that we've got, which seems completely mad. It seems like we're the bargain of the NHS, that actually I think it's very wise that people need to come to the GP before A&E. I think that's a sensible solution, um, but would be completely unmanageable at the present state because the fa long-term failure to um, uh, invest in general practice has led to a, a situation where general practice is unable to, keep, to cope with demand. I'm going to touch on demand because I think there's a bit about the overuse and actually um, suggesting that patients are um, wasteful in use. I suspect we're beginning to say that more and more because actually we failed to meet demand. Um, that it's very difficult for me to say, I, uh, my practice in Dingwall is a small, um, small town practice, and I've been there for 25 years in the same, same consulting room for 25 years. Um, and in that time, the consultation rate has gone up. It used to be about three and a half times People will come to us on average three and a half times a year. It's now gone up to five, five times a year. But hand on heart, I can't say that people are coming in with more minor conditions and wasting my time. In fact, my perception is that actually patients rarely come to us with minor upper respiratory tract infections. They know the answer is not going to be antibiotics now and are far better able to manage it. Actually, the problem has been the large increase in multimorbidity, large numbers of people with multiple conditions, um, and the challenges that we've had to deal with that, and the shift of, that should really have happened, of, of, the shift of care from hospitals to general practice that we tried to meet but, but failed to. So I suppose it's, it's fascinating to see the, the Norwegian um, answers. It's fascinating to see here that the primary care is controlled completely separately, I was really interested about the integration. Integration here has been about integration of organizations. So the organizations have come together as these hybrid organizations, um, which has had partial success. Um, Scottish government commissioned some um, evidence from the University of York, which suggested that integration as planned um, would possibly have some marginal benefits, but would be time consuming and costly. I believe in Highland where we've been ahead of the game, that's proved to be the case. And I must admit, the idea of integrating um, via contractual integration sounds like a, a sensible way to go and something that maybe we've missed the, missed the chance to. I agree with you that we, ha we have had co-payments for some time. Anyone who goes to the dentist knows that. Um, anyone who, um, and we used to have that with prescriptions. And you're absolutely right. I think only 15% of prescriptions were actually charged for when they were there um, because the vast majority of people who um, were ill enough to need multiple prescriptions. Exactly, and part of the reason that more and more, uh, by, by the time yeah, you have a multiple conditions, you've got a shopping list of drugs, um, and the chance that you're going to have to still pay for those individually is less and less. And I don't think we've missed that a great deal. But So co-payments, when we, think, we talk about co-payments, we have had that in the past, but actually interestingly in Scotland, we've moved away from that. But it's fascinating to see how that all ties together. Um, I'm actually more interested in some of the ways that the health service is funded um, and that balance of how you balance um, new treatments um, versus uh, uh, what you want to downscale because we've certainly got a problem of overdiagnosis in some areas um, and particularly things like screening. And I agree with you, there's a real threat from private medicine and, and private screening um, which could easily blow the budget for very little health gain as well. So thank you very much for asking me to, despite unexpected to have a chance to, to mention that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's a whole stack of questions here, but I just wanted, before you start on, on those uh, professional ones, can I just clear up some sort of nuts and bolts things here um, about what is and isn't covered? Because when you were talking about, for example, um, just you skipped over physio as somebody who's just had quite a lot of physio. Um, is that something someone could in Norway could expect to get on your health service as opposed to private provision? 
Yeah. Right, because this seems to be the big thing then. I mean, we here would say we have a, we do have a free health service at point of care, but if you need physio, you can forget it. You're not going to get physio on the NHS, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 right, okay. So let me, right. I live in, I work in, I live in Fife and I waited for years. Right, but that's just by the point. I mean, has anyone else here had that difficulty with physio? Yeah. That you wouldn't dream of going to the NHS for physio? You just wait too long. You wait too long. So that's the thing. If, if I was paying whatever it is, uh, 7%, you know, to, to get a certainty of some physio, I think I would be beginning to chuckle. Right, let me just wait, wait, wait. Um, can I ask dentistry? Is dentistry free? On the, is it on your health service? No, it's not. Right. Uh, 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 dentistry is free for children up to the age of 18 and some of the more serious conditions that can uh, uh, threaten your teeth is clearly defined and included as, as a part of specialized health care, as, as hospital care. Uh, but that makes up only a tiny proportion of it. Okay, so but it's, it, it's but that, that's an ongoing political debate. The the um, the Labour Party now wants to include dentistry uh, in the system over the same principles as gen, general practice. Right, um, nursing homes. Uh, you you can take income and pensions, but not the home of the person. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay, and um, the contribution that's made is about 7% of the costs. Yeah. So you would expect, you would, would a Norwegian expect to, to be able to enter a nursing home that was a very high quality provided by the state and not lose their home? Yeah. Right, these are pretty major differences mm. really. Um, I can tell you, just as an example, my, my mother-in-law, she, she, she has developed a dementia and has, uh, just earlier this year, she got a permanent nursing home uh, situation. So what happens then is that the council takes about, they, they take 75% of her pension and she she has a relatively good pension because she has been working as a teacher. Uh, so she is left with two or three thousand kroners a month to spend, which doesn't matter because she's not spending anything anyway. Um, but they, they, they will never take any of her assets, whatever she have in the bank or in shares or her house. That's not being touched. Prescriptions. Do you pay for prescriptions? Yeah, we do, and I, I didn't go into that uh, because it's, it's a different system, actually. It's outside the system that I now talked about. It's a, um, it's a national system, which is pretty complex, too. Um, but roughly, uh, if you have an ac acute illness and need short-term relatively cheap treatment, like let's say a child get a tonsillitis or I get a pneumonia, then, I have, then, then you have to pay everything. If, if you get a urinary uh, tract infection, uh, then you pay everything yourself. If you get a chronic condition, um, then, then, you, then there is some co-payment, but you get most of it covered. Like using myself as an example again, I have, I have uh, activity uh, related asthma uh, and I get about 80% of my inhaling <laughs> covered by, by the system. But that would mean if you, if you had a, a kind of one-off bad event, I've forgotten the example you gave, you would have to bear the entire cost of that prescription yourself, the full cost of it. Yeah, you would, but I, I cannot really think about anything that that would be expensive with regard to prescription because um, if you get a serious illness, 
which is going to last for some time, then you get into um, to the hospital being responsible for providing some of the necessary medicines. Like, like if you get cancer, for example, and need biological treatment, then it's on the hospital budget. Okay, and I know that they're all ganging up there to ask you questions, which is fine, but um, what, what lots of people were asking in different ways was coming back to something that you're not clear about yourself, which is really why did co-payment start? Because people are asking about the cost of administration. We've gone through dropping the cost of prescriptions and have not discovered a huge uptake in silly prescriptions. Um, you know, how are you sure that it's actually the business of co-payments is achieving some kind of better management of demand? Well, I say that I'm not sure about that, and I, I don't even feel that I'm here to defend it. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, what, what I tried to say was that it's been around forever. I tried to find out how the decision was taken to introduce it and when it was taken, and that must have been before the Internet, at least, because I oh. couldn't find any information about it. I, so, I actually had a look when I saw you, because yeah? I was intrigued as well. And the only thing I found was um, a suggestion that it was to generate funds to employ more GPs. Must have been a long time back, a lo lo long, uh, very long back in time. Labour governments who wanted to increase the number of GPs and could only do that by getting more money into the system was the suggestion. But then there's the difference as well, that the number of GPs is presumably vastly greater in Norway. Yeah, I think so. The, no, the, uh, it's not. It's about it? the same. Really? It's right, about one, one per 1,500 population? It's okay. It's and somehow you manage to have longer consultations. You can't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So have you... Uh, there was lots of specific questions. Do you think you're able to work through any of them? Yeah, uh, maybe not. I, I don't think I can answer all, all these specific questions questions, but I, I guess that there's a few comments that I'd I like to make. Um, I guess the first one is that, at least in Norway, I think we have to realize that we, we already have problems which cannot be solved with funding. We, we, we as you know, we at least theoretically, we have the funding, we have all this money in, in, um, in, in this huge fund. Um, but as I, I said in another discussion, uh, uh, that there are no nurses in the, uh, in, in the oil fund. Um, so I think it's quite clear that we, we, have, we have more healthcare workers per population in Norway than in any other European country. So we are touching the point where uh, it's getting impossible to recruit a higher proportion of young people to healthcare. And demand obviously is going to increase while the number of healthcare workers isn't because we know we can count them. They are born already. Could, could you, so, that was a conversation we had. Um, I've just, we did a podcast earlier. Um, could you just explain a bit more about how the, the collapse of uh, the Norwegian kroner has sent Swedes and Danes scurrying back home? Yeah, we had this acute episode about five years ago. We, we used to have a lot of Danish and Swedish and some Finnish nurses uh, working, they they made up maybe maybe ten percent of our staff, um, and then when the oil prices dropped, then the Norwegian currency dropped uh, with about twenty percent against the other Nordic currencies, and then most of the Swedes and Danes left, uh, and this now seems to be a stable situation, so they are not coming back. Um, I. To be honest, I think that's good because the Swedes really have problems with a lack of nurses. They, they were closing emergency departments uh, during the holiday season just last summer. Not because of a lack of funding, but because of a lack of staff. So they, they I mean, the Swedes need their nurses themselves. It's not fair that we, 
it wasn't fair that we were buying them. So that, 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 that's, that's, one, um, that's one comment. Uh, so, so I guess my point is that whether we like it or not, healthcare has to become more efficient. And not from experience, but from going through the evidence in the literature, I, I think that co-payment can be used to restrict demand, but I, I think it's quite obvious that that comes with the backside of the medal, which is that, 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 uh, that you will delay um, presentation in some patients. So, uh, on the other hand, unnecessary presentations, which we all feel we don't have. Um, but if we say that some proportion must be unnecessary, is a stress to an overloaded system, which is obviously going to be more stressed over the years to come. So I, I feel pretty convinced that we, we, we have no other choice than developing methods to restrict demand. I'm completely convinced we have to do that. Not because we lack money, but because we lack staff. And, and, and we, there's no way around it. Um, and the <coughs> absolutely worst thing that can happen is increasing privatization, because they will not restrict demand. They will only recruit healthcare workers educated by the, by the public system. So I think we face some very difficult dilemmas here, and, and um, the value of co-payment in this discussion. I, I completely agree that it probably doesn't make sense to administrate it. Um, now, we, we do not have any problems recruiting administrative staff. <laughs> uh, but at least at the moment, there is, there is no way to send them to nursing school either. So, so uh, I think these are just very difficult dilemmas. I, I personally, I think that co-payment probably could play a role, maybe not a very important one, in, in managing demand, but uh, it obviously comes with a downside. Okay, the docs, you get a little response, and then let's bring the whole audience in, so get your well, questions ready. Thank you, Leslie. Firstly, your physio, um, you should be getting it free on the NHS. The problem that we have <laughs> is a lack of staff, and it's a lack of staff both in physio, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and indeed doctors. If you look at Fife, there's 25% of the consultant posts are vacant. They're not staffed. Mm. We have inadequate nurses. Um, I hesitate to mention it here, but Brexit is driving many of our European colleagues back to, to Europe. We have German doctors that are moving back to Germany. We also have a worldwide demographic time bomb, which is challenging the entire Western world mm. in terms of the populations getting older, the complexity of their illnesses getting more complex, the demands that they make getting higher and our increasing ability to do something about it. Mm. We put very effective knee replacements in now. I've got two. Um, we didn't used to do that a long, not that long ago. Um, we can do neurosurgery now that we couldn't even have dreamt about 25 years ago. Mm. Um, we've had MRI, CT, and all of that has come in during my career. I remember giving anaesthetics with ether, and I'm not, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> um, what Miles said, I think, is very important. Yes, there are people who come and abuse the system and don't really need to. <coughs> and we perhaps see the drunks on Friday and Saturday night in A&E. But on the other hand, is the best place for them anywhere else other than A&E if they're unconscious? We see the police forces increasingly seeing themselves looking after mental health because no one else is. There is no one else to pick up the pieces. I think one of the important things that Tor said that, we, that perhaps hasn't been picked up on is that the hospitals organize the retrieval services. They have control of the ambulances, the aircraft, and they utilize them to the best effect 
planned against the demand of what they've got. And it's act, having worked with the ambulance services in, in Scandinavia, and particularly in Norway, they are a lot more efficiently managed against the need and the demand than we manage here with the centralized services that we have. We have a problem. Our doctors are emigrating to Australia. We've still got Adam, but um, he might end up in Canada. The Australians are going to the US, and if you go to Melbourne or Brisbane or even Sydney now, you will co likely come across a British doctor. My psychologist daughter just emigrated to Sydney. <laughs> there you go. Um, and it's because the working conditions are better, the pay is better, and they are, they, they get more um, sense of a satisfaction out of the job they do. We are working really, really hard here at the moment, and it, it's a very difficult environment to work in. Can I just, just jump in there, because uh, is that true of, of, of Norway as well, that the, you, know, you mentioned that the staff feel more stress? Is that what's making your daughter want to jump ship and go to Australia? No, 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 it's not. Uh, that's me being stupid, bringing her along on uh, research sabbaticals. <laughs> <laughs> she would just have heard from her friends. There's a huge passage of that happening everywhere. But, I mean, is this the reason, I wonder when we come down to shortages, there are a lot of difficulties within the NHS that everyone in the room who lives here would be aware of, um, and pay issues as well. Mm. Um, but do those exist in Norway as well, issues of low pay for nurses? I mean, what is causing your nursing shortages? Well, uh, it's, it's commonly believed in Norway that, that there is a big proportion of nurses stopping to work in healthcare. And that's actually not true. We, we, uh, we did a survey quite recently. Uh, Helen Brandstorp, who, who you seem to know, was leading it. Uh, so we surveyed all nurses educated in the northern part of the country over the last 20 years. And 86% of them were employed almost full time in healthcare. Uh, the 14% who had left uh, were Half of them, 7%, were in administrative work, which is relevant to healthcare, such as teaching healthcare in uh, secondary schools or working at the administration of a local council, which perfectly makes sense. And 7% were uh, on disability pension, which isn't any higher than, any, uh, than in, in any other profession. So at, at the moment, it, it seems that the staff that we have educated that applies both to doctors and nurses, they, they are working very hard, just as you say, within the system. Uh, so we are, we are really, in my opinion, meeting the capacity limit of the system. And I do have some opinions about what we should do. I, th I, I personally, I think we have to centralize more. Um, that's one of the things we, we spend a lot of staff in Norway of, on, on people being on call at small hospitals and in remote councils where there are very few patients presenting. So that, that's one possible source for more staff, a very controversial point of view, but that, that's one of my opinions. Uh, we have another challenge, which I'm not sure whether you have, but we, we have this idea that, we, which, which is in the contracts with, the, with most of the unions, that nobody should work more often than every third weekend. I think we'll have to challenge that at some time. It doesn't go up with the idea that the quality should be the same. Uh, uh, 24, 7, 365. So there are, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, that might restrict recruiting again. So <laughs> it's not easy. Can I just ask you on, on those ones, um, is that the th every third weekend working, is that for GPs or for uh, every type of doctor in a hospital as well? It's more or less perceived as, as uh, a right for everybody. It's, it's, I'm not sure about... Uh, 
uh, GPs actually. But remember when we talked earlier, is there an NHS 24 that comes in at night time when the doctors are there the whole no, no. time, aren't they? No, no. So they are that's there. the point that yeah. they, they are doing what? So it's prob like we were yes. NHS it's probably worth noting that whilst NHS 24 comes in at night, it's a cool handling triage service. So our GPs work through the night. They may not work out of their practice through the night, but they work out of the Royal Infirmary, they work out of St. John's, they work out of um, various sort of local centres. I think some work out of Leith Treatment Centre. So our GPs don't not work overnight. It's just that the centre, as you say, we've centralised the service. So there are in <laughs> All right. Some from, of, from some of them choose not to. Yeah, two, 2004. Um, we're allowed to opt out of general pra out of out of on call thing, and actually, I think that was a mistake. Um, it was done because um, we were short of GPs at mm. the time, and it was done because they thought they could do that rather than invest in general practice again. Um, we're now True. so, and actually, I don't think this has been good for the service because actually, in many areas, you don't have doctors on call in out of hours at all. Sometimes. Um, and I, think you're I think the issue about rural, rural areas is really interesting. I'm presently working with two communities on the West Coast, one of 170 patients and people, and one of 270, which really for sometimes have no access to anything apart from helicopter or a lifeboat to take them off the island. Um, and I think we have to look at what sort of a society we want because we might find that these places no longer, people no longer want to live there. Um, and for a rural place like Norway or Scotland, that could see serious implications um, because we may well have large areas of our country with no one living in it at all. Right, this is getting cheery. Um, <laughs> okay, um, can, well, well, just that everybody's sitting here, but um, we'll, we'll need a little well, bit well, of... Okay, well, very quickly. The distances you deal with in, in Norway are truly staggering um, and are much greater than ours. But the distribution of health care that I've seen in Norway is probably slightly more even than we have in our yeah. really remote and rural places. Yeah. You go to places like Yell and Ernst in Shetland, it's quite challenged. That presumably is related to having 422 councils that fight for their right to party. So that, they, you they know. are focused on the local area. Yeah, yeah no, and I, I was just going to make a brief comment on that, which is that we have had this, this discussion about integrating the organizations, um, transferring health care from the, from the local councils to the health enterprises. And one of the major arguments against that has been a loss of local power with a risk for reduced equality in the system. Yeah. Right. Everybody else? <laughs> Thoughts? Look at this. Right, okay. I'm going to hold on to the microphone just because you won't... You won't. So, uh, we did, people need to hear it. Hi. One of the things that uh, interests me is, is health inequalities. And I noticed you didn't mention that. And, um, because I was quite fascinated by it, because I did a little bit of reading before I came along tonight, and noticed that health inequalities, is one of the goals of health policy and government policy in Scotland is to reduce health inequalities. And I did a bit of reading it on the Institute of Public Health in Norway, and yours have actually been getting really quite badly worse over since the 1960s, going up from about two to three years to sort of six, seven years. And that would seem something that is relevant to people having to co-pay. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, because it's certainly not something we would want. In, it's not part of policy in Scotland, and I think it would demotivate people working in health and social care in Scotland if it wasn't one of our goals. Well, uh, now your, your, your dialect is a bit more Scottish than the other guys okay. here. So. The, question, <laughs> but, but the I, question was about health, health inequalities. Yeah, I was I, almost going to stop you and say, slow down. <laughs> but, um, uh, health inequalities uh, in, in, increasing since the 1960s in Norway, and is that connected to co-payments? I don't think so. I, I think, or, or I know that one of the main reasons for it is immigration. We, we, have, uh, we have received a lot of immigrants from, especially from North Africa, who who actually are poor people, and, and the Norwegian social system and our, our uh, employment market hasn't integrated them. So they, they have poor health because they are poor. So I, I, I think that 
the most important measure to reduce health in, uh, inequality uh, is to um, to to, uh, to develop better mechanisms for integration of immigrants, disabled people, whoever uh, in the labor market. Our, our labor market has become a lot more competitive than it used to be. That's not what your Institute of Public, that's not what your Institute of Public Health says. Because uh, it's people, they compare people who have got secondary, this is lower secondary education against um, university education, and I say it's been increasing since the 1960s, steadily, it's a steady increase. And you weren't getting huge amounts of immigration in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, that's a recent right. phenomenon, and it's a phenomenon that's been going on in Norway, as I said, for 60 years. Perhaps when co-payments were introduced, because it's prior to the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm aware of that statistic too, and, and um, well, I, th this is just a personal belief. I haven't looked into the evidence, but I, I, I think that it's more generally related to increasing differences in income. Um, people with high incomes generally, uh, generally have available to uh, have availability to a range of measures that improves your health, better housing. L less traveling to work, better car safer cars. I mean, th th you can make a long list. So I, again, I'm quite convinced that the most important thing we can do to reduce health inequality is to compress the wage mass in society and to, 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 uh, to flatten out the differences between people. Hi there. Um, I was going to ask about your urgent care services. So you seem to have a very robust gatekeeping mechanism on accessing emergency medicine departments from your general practitioners. Is this, is this too fast? Yeah, it's too fast. <laughs> so I was asking about your accident and emergency access. Yeah. So your GPs are very good at gatekeeping to prevent uh, excessive self-referral to emergency departments. I was wondering, once the GPs have decided a patient does require urgent hospital care, mm. does everyone go through the same channel into emergency department? Do you have alternative urgent care facilities available? And is there co-payment attached to that as well? Uh, no. Um, if the GP wants to, to refer the patient to the hospital, uh, then that's done immediately, and generally speaking, there is there is no queue in the A and E departments. It can happen at rare occasions, but normally not. Um, the the GP can can have an opinion on whether he is admitting the patient for, an, for as an inpatient or referring him for uh, for a judgment, but. Quite independently of that, the, the physicians in A&E will make their own assessments. Um, so if admittance for an overnight stay is considered necessary, then there is no co-payment. If you are treated in A&E as, a, uh, as an outpatient, then there is a co-payment, which is the amounts that I refer to as a specialist consultation. Was that answer to your question? It yeah. does, yeah. I was wondering then, on the basis of that, do you see any manipulation of diagnoses in order to avoid payments? Or is there any change in behavior linked in with that? I, I have never heard that raised as an issue. I don't think so. Talk in your... Do your general practitioners refer directly to specialties, or does it all come to emergency medicine? They, we, we do not have the A and E specialty, so they, they, the, the A and E uh, is staffed with nurses, and then this, the specialists uh, and the physicians in training from the different specialties come to see their own patients. What is a problem is that there is a group of patients who nobody wants to see. Yeah. What typically happens is that 
Let's see, you admit, uh, you refer a patient with uh, a possible uh, stroke. Then the neurologist comes and sees the patient and says, no, it's not a stroke. Um, and then the nurses have to call around to find someone else to take responsibility. So this can delay patients in A&E uh, just because all the different specialties tend to try to define their own activity. So that, that's, that, that's a quality problem and not a capacity problem. Dave? I'm sitting here um, wondering how I managed to walk into Lillehammer A&E about three years ago without seeing a GP with an infected toe. But of course I'm British so I break the rules. Um, and I paid about £25 for the treatment. But I uh, wanted to ask you about young, young people and... Um, medical treatment. Uh, our son actually is working in Tromso at the moment and, really? uh, uh, on, on marine litter and as he does a lot of snowboarding. <laughs> <laughs> a few hospitals and he Sounds reports uh, it's all very satisfactory. But I really wanted to ask you about our daughter who had a brain tumour when she was 11 years old and uh, a seven year battle with that before she died. And uh, she had um, some excellent treatments in the hospitals in Scotland, particularly here in the Sick Kids and in Newcastle. But when she got back to school, she had big challenges as regards uh, losing friends and, uh, and isolation. And, uh, and then we went to try and use the, me the, the mental health services. Mm -hmm. And that was all a real struggle. And in fact, in the last few months of her life, she produced a, a blog and detailed problems. And afterwards, we talked to the public health minister here in Scotland about this. So I wonder, what, I'm really wondering, when you have young people who have such serious problems, how, how do you better integrate the point where they've had the surgery because you know we were two years beyond the surgery before the mental health support really kicked in and also what about the education service for young people in that position to what extent um, does the hospital sort of services continuing to the health into the education side of things because what we said to the minister was that was the biggest problem of all uh, relationships fellow pupils in school. Okay, that's a, um, that it's a story that, 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 that's make, that makes an impression. Um, I, I, I'd say I don't think we're very good at that either, unfortunately. Um, we, in our system, mental health used to be in a, in a different organization until about 20 years ago. So by then, uh, mental health and somatic care was organized under the same leadership. Um, we have had continuous discussions during the 10 years that I have been in the CEO position uh, about a need for improved collaboration between uh, mental health and uh, and uh, somatic care. We, we, we did a change with regard to, uh, to children, uh, organizing it together again at, at the level of the division, which means that in our hospital, pediatrics and mental health for, for uh, children and adolescents and uh, have rehabilitation for children is under the same leadership. And I do have the impression that they have improved. But when it comes to adults, then it's uh, not as good as it should be. And we, we also integrated um, addiction therapy in our organization maybe 10 years ago, and, and we made a big organizational change 
less than five years ago to make addiction therapy and psychiatry work together. That's what my psychologist daughter was working with before she left for Australia. And they, her, her department just got a report from, what do you call it, the controlling health inspectorate, uh, which wasn't good at all. So no, that, that's, uh, that, that's a challenge. And uh, yeah, I, I do not have any good what answer about, to it. What about the educational school system? Is sure. there integration? Sorry, what? Uh, what? Is there integration with the school? Yeah, there, there is, but that's, that's related to the mental health services in primary care. Uh, so we have this two-level system in mental health as well, so the councils have their own basic mental health, uh, which is integrated with the schools. Um, at the um, specialist level, it... Uh, it is to some degree, meaning that um, mental health staff from the hospitals might liaise with the schools in a specific case, uh, but not on a permanent basis. Just to answer very briefly from the point of view of Scotland, the child and adolescent mental health services, uh, it is very sad what you say, but it's very real, and it's happening and will continue to happen today. Child and adolescent health, mental health is a challenge across a lot of countries and I think as a profession we haven't recognised how important it was and how much of it that there, there needs to be looked after and our, the capacity of our child and, and adolescent services is way below what, what it should be. It's way below what is needed. Now the problem comes when you say well we need to increase that and, and Miles has, has referred to the fact that general practices had to shrink well, secondary cares had to shrink. Everything's shrinking to try and keep things going. We've got expensive hospitals that we're paying for under the PFI scheme, and that money just goes out whether we like it or not. And we, what we haven't had is the money, the time, the space to invest in expanding services like child and adolescent services, which we do need to do. No doctor in, in Scotland would argue that we shouldn't. It, we haven't there is no money, there is no resource. We are short of doctors, we're short of nurses, and we're short of money. Hi, I, I just wanted, uh, I, there are lots of interesting debates coming up, but you'll hear about make, people making personal contributions to the health service and its impact on, uh, on A, income for the health service, and B, the control of people um, coming appropriately rather than inappropriately into healthcare. And I think the point, oh, it started working now. I think the point uh, this gentleman made about whether there was a correlation uh, between charging and, uh, and health differentials, uh, if I get you right, I think you're saying there are other social factors that contributed to that and that it's probably not charging at point of service. You seem to be saying that there was to do with income differentials and other poverty issues rather than uh, simply the business of charging. Um, now, in explaining that, I've gone and forgotten what I was going to ask. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah al although the charges seem quite modest, you were suggesting that it's 20% contribution to the health service. And that's not unsubstantial. And um, we, we had the debate about whether that worked for us in charging for prescriptions. And I don't think charges for prescriptions covered anything like 20% of income towards prescriptions and the whole business of charging for pharmaceuticals and so on is another huge debate. Um, so am I right in understanding it's 20% uh, income for health services or is it just for GP services? Just for GPs. Just for GPs, yeah. but it's substantial. So I'm, I'm just raising the question that it, whether, whether you believe in it or not ethically and it should be free at the point of contact, whether it is something that is worth considering. Uh, the whole reasons for why we've got a shrinking NHS are, are, are uh, complex. So uh, it's just one consideration, isn't it? Does that make it look different to, I'd, I'd to love you? To give you some, can I give you some thoughts on that? I know, I know you're asking the question of tour primarily, but I think it's when we talk about the 20% of the budget, um, 
Co-payments are a way of shifting payment for health services from the population at large to the individuals who are using it. Um, a lot of people have stood up here and said that we don't have a problem with inappropriate attendances in the NHS. And I, so we don't need it for that. Um, two things. Firstly, I'm not going to say that because I work in the emergency department and we absolutely do have a problem with inappropriate attendances. But the inappropriate attenders are the people who attend when they're not really sick enough to need my care or the care of my colleagues. Um, what that means is that they turn up. If it's not busy, they come in, I see them, I send them home. It doesn't take very long. There's a cost associated with it, but it's not huge. If it's busy, they turn up, they sit in the waiting room for a long time, they really inconvenience themselves, they get absolutely nothing out of the visit apart from my smiling face, which I appreciate is marvellous. Uh, I'm kidding. And then they go home, and they don't cost very much. I would far rather see 10 of them and one person who needs to be there than not see them and miss the one person who needs to be there. And all that we are doing with co-payments is shifting the, shifting the burden of payment from the people who, from everyone, to the individuals who use the health service most. And a small proportion of those are there inappropriately and, a, and they are costing us a small proportion of additional funding. Yes, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to work there. It's frustrating to sit at home and think that that's what your taxes are paying for. But it was much more frustrating to me to think of the person who presents late or doesn't present because they can't or they're afraid of a small co-payment than it is to think of those people who, are, who attend, you know, possibly inappropriately. And actually, a lot of them have got something underlying going on anyway. We also know that the people who use the health service most, as we've had all this conversation about healthcare inequality, the people who use the health service most, who need it most, are the people at the bottom of the socioeconomic brackets, by and large. And so actually, we're... We're shifting the payments from people who are healthy and well off to people who are unhealthy and less well off. And I don't think that we have the demand problem that we need to limit. And there's a question about whether it would work anyway. But I don't think we have the problem. So that, that would be my thoughts on it. Okay, um, one more question here. Uh, this, this question is for the future. And it comes out of what's been said by both the Scots and, and yourself you have an anxiety there's not going to be enough staff in the future of whatever sort, medics, nurses, whatever. And the question really is, is there somebody in, administ in administration uh, doing forward planning to calculate how many you need to get into medical schools, nursing schools, and so on? And, uh, and has, that been, has that been planned out for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Well, we, we do in, in Norway, <laughs> but it's, it, 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 it's quite difficult because the, um, the different scenarios uh, on, on the demography and, uh, and the possible changes that the politicians might or might not accept um, are quite wide. So, but it, it is being done by, uh, in Norway by, um, uh, at the national level by Statistics Norway, and it's actually a, a task allocated down to the single health enterprise in their collaboration with the educational institutions in the, uh, the different regions. So it is being done, but I guess that the uncertainty in that work is quite high. So what was the laughter that came from the Scottish side there? I, uh, well, I, I think the Norwegians are slightly better at recruitment and retention than we are. You, you tend to hang on to their own doctors and nurses better than we do, but you still lose them a, a, as well. You've also got to remember, I think, in Norway, that living in Oslo is very, very different from living in Hammerfest. And living in Hammerfest is a very strange world when it's dark half the year, and then it does, the sun doesn't go to bed at all in the summertime. And, and you have to be comfortable with that type of living. So there, there is a geographical issue in, term, in terms of recruitment. Yes, in Scotland we plan, as we do across the UK, to try and train enough doctors and nurses for the demand that we have. There are two problems with that. Is we, we're not proving capable of keeping them. The recruitment is fine when they're just coming out of medical school but we don't hang on to them. Huge numbers of them, 40% of doctors that came out two years ago in Scotland have, let, have disappeared, have gone elsewhere. Other way around, 60%. 60%, do, 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 so 60% have, have, have gone, we've got 40% left. Hang on a minute, 
60% of doctors that, wrote, that came Trying out of school appear. two years ago have gone. Yep. Out of, uh, uh, to the south of the UK or out so of the UK? The actual, the, the the actual statistic, sorry, the actual, the actual number is that only 42% of foundation year two doctors who finished the first two years postgraduate then progressed into specialty training. That's in immediate progression. The statistics are not much better for a year later, so taking a year out. And the suggestion is that people are no longer returning. It used to be that people took a year or two out and 95% of them were back within two years. But Tor's question is, where have they gone? To They're England, to, to Australia? Australia, Australia. So this is a UK-wide statistic. So it means they've left the UK. But, uh, they've but, left training in the UK. But they're not leaving the profession. Um, some are, but that's not the big cause of no. it. Some no. are, yeah. And um, the other difference that we've got that has hit us is that 20 years ago, over 65% of all the medical school graduates were males. And I'm going to be, try, be careful not to be sexist here. It's now 65% females. While there is an increasing number of male doctors who want to work less than full time, there's a very large number of female doctors that want to work less than full time. And that has not been well planned into how we actually think about the numbers. And it's a, it's, it's a matter that's affecting other countries as well. It's not unique to the UK, but it is a particular challenge here. Jeremy Hunt, you may see, has tried to increase the number of people going to medical school. But in actual fact, we have medical school places that we can't fill all of them because the cost of going to medical school is now very high. Many of our medical students are coming out with eye-watering levels of debt. And it's not as attractive as it used to be. Is that different here where they're not paying fees? <laughs> the fees are not the only bit that yes, causes the cost. Yeah. I, it, it's the time and <laughs> the cost of living and all the rest of it. And as, as a medical student, it is a full-on university course. You don't get time to work. You don't get time to work your way through university, which is becoming the norm for many of us current students. Uh, right. And so it's a disincentive. We are, we are discouraging applicants from backgrounds where their parents cannot support them. And that's the wrong thing to be doing. Right, this has got to have been easily the most depressing Nordic Horizons <laughs> meeting there has ever been. <laughs> but, but actually, I'm very grateful to you for, for coming and, you know, reality proofing We're still here. what We're we still know. Here. And you are still here. <laughs> and Tor, for, you know, bringing your, your, the different system which questions some of our presumptions here, some of them we might want to hang on to for dear life, some of them we might need to think a little bit about, but, but certainly the comment you made to me, which was that you need high taxes to generate enough money for all of the solutions that you've managed to find, yeah. yep. remains a big question for all of us here, which we didn't even have time to get into today. Make so, a very quick suggestion to Tor. The average Norwegian probably worries more about the price of a bottle of wine than they do about paying the GP to go and see them. Probably. <laughs> right, well, as a, as a non-drinker for 18 years, I'm always staggered at how we managed to get a kind of mention of a price of alcohol when we talk about Norway. But anyway, um, really, many thanks to uh, the, the Scottish doctors, to yourself for coming, but uh, primarily to Tor Ingebrigtsen for a fabulous talk. Thank you. <laughs>